decided to do for this particular talk was, it's, in some ways, it's sort of a jet, uh, picking about four examples just on various aspects of what I've described as a, the broad definition of discrimination. In other words, it may not actually be discriminatory, but it certainly fits into potentially discriminatory situations. Okay? So I picked two th examples from, uh, from Australia. One is the Adam Good situation from last year. And the other one, I know it's fairly old now, but the pregnancy with uh, netball, uh, because I still think that's a very interesting case to look at, to see looking at the, uh, what was done, the legal aspects of that, and the legal outcome of it, and what was then done afterwards. And then being uh, the Olympic, Olympic year, I thought it was good to look at, the, the, in general terms, uh, discrimination within the Olympic Games. And also I wanted to have a quick look at cricket as, as an example of an international sport which has faced uh, r problems with racism, as, so that aspect of discrimination, and what it's done to actually respond to that. So I'll start off with the AFL and the Adam Goods situation. And before I do say anything on it, I do have to disclose that I am a Sydney Swans member and supporter. All right, <laughs> so I just try and do it as objectively as possible, but I do have to dis dis disclose that information. First comment to make about the AFL is that approximately 12% of the players are Indigenous, which is six times the, the population. So the population I understand in Australia is approximately 2% Indigenous, and yet it's 12% in the AFL. So that's obviously something that uh, needs to be kept in mind, that the AFL certainly needs to have uh, policies in relation to racism because of that particular uh, situation. In the AFL, there was in the 1990s, there was a couple of situations which really started to highlight this as well. One was the Nicky Winmar when he uh, copped a lot of abuse at Victoria Park. I was actually watching that game on TV. And uh, yeah, it was pretty disgraceful what he actually suffered. But he played brilliantly. And then he did a brilliant thing, of, for those of you may have seen a photo of it, pulled his uh, jumper up and just pointed at his skin as he walked past the, the uh, Collingwood Social Club. Around about the same time too, Michael Long was uh, racially vilified by Damien Monkus, again a Collingwood uh, player. Uh, Collingwood comes up quite a bit in my talk, I'm afraid, and that's just purely, they're the ones who have done it, and I haven't been selective here. And that actually let Michael Long sort of made a very strong stance on that. There was a situation where there was a mediation sort of process and the AFL came out and said, you know, we think everything's okay, and Nicky, uh, sorry, um, Michael Long's going, nope, and he's actually having his own press conference saying, no, I was completely unhappy with the situation, but eventually that did lead to policies within the AFL uh, in regards to this, and I think it's worked very well since. And the principle behind it is that have a, a mediation conciliation uh, set up, and then the actual player who's actually uh, the offender actually imposes a, a penalty on themselves, all right? Best example of that was Peter Everett, uh, who imposed four weeks on himself, he said he wasn't aware that he had made a racially discriminatory comment, but he accepted he was in the wrong and he, t he imposed four weeks suspension on him, on himself. All right, so they, I, th I think, and since then there's been no real problems in regard to, I think, between the players. And I, the other, first comment I'd make is the fact that I think controlling this within the players is relatively straightforward. And the reason for that is you've got the, the support of contracts, all right, so you can actually enforce penalties through all the contractual uh, situations gets much more difficult with the spectators, first of all to actually identify the actual spectator sometimes and also actually enforcing things on the, on the spectators, although it has to be acknowledged that they can be banned from the grounds and that is always a, a, a potential there, um, penalty for, for those particular uh, offenders. Now with Adam Goods, it's been three in a row in, in about in space of a few years. The first one was in a game on the 25th of April in 2013, again against Collingwood where he was called an ape by, it then turned out to be a 13-year-old girl. She was there with her mother. The, the Adam Goods actually brought this to attention of the security guard and she was led away. By the way, the mother didn't move from her seat. So this talk that he, uh, Adam Goods sort of was directing to a 13-year-old, there was a responsible adult there who took no responsibility at all. Okay, so it wasn't like she was led away uh, without a potentially a, a responsible adult going with her. That got resolved quite, quite well in the sense that what I mean is that there was uh, discussions between both the, the, the girl involved and Adam Goods. Adam Goods, I thought, was very, very good about it, saying it's education that's needed. You can't actually you know, point the finger too strong at her because of the fact she is only 13. The following year, there was a situation in the game against Essendon, uh, with Sydney Swans are playing Essendon, and apparently one of the Essendon supporters called him a gorilla. 
He never actually heard it, it was sort of further up in the stands. But that was handled by the actual spectators themselves. The members of Essendon, to their credit, reported him, he was ejected, and Essendon actually banned him for matches and tore up his membership. All right? So that, that was a positive outcome in that regard and, and was showing that the other supporters were actually taking responsibility for it. We then had Eddie Maguire suggest that uh, Adam Goods could come down to Melbourne and promote the musical King Kong. He said that on radio. Uh, that set up a, quite a bit of a discussions, in inverted commas, between Sydney Swans and Eddie Maguire over the next few, few days and weeks. I felt he got off very lightly. I might be a bit biased because the team I support, but I feel he should have been suspended for about, you know, maybe even months. All right? If you look at overseas, as comparisons. David Whelan, who's involved with Wigan, made a comment there, which he, and he banned, was banned for six, for six weeks. And even if you go to American basketball, you've got the Donald Sterling situation where he actually had to get out of the sport. So I think Eddie Maguire got off very, very lightly, and I personally think that uh, a much heavier penalty should have been imposed on Eddie Maguire for the comments that he's made. Now, the final thing has been what went on last year with a lot of booing that went on. I was watching the game uh, against the West Coast Eagles, which was in round 17, and I just remember watching and thinking to myself, this is just getting out of hand, all right? It just had be got, gone beyond what, in my opinion, was acceptable. It wasn't acceptable to Adam Goods because he then stood down from the Sydney Swans that week, fully supported by the club, and spent the week away. They then played Adelaide the following week. It was, I was actually at the SCG that day, and it was quite moving. The spectators, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the, the uh, supporters uh, squad had actually arranged for everybody to stand up, or they initiated and everybody else stood up at the seventh minute of the third quarter, because his number's 37, and that was following on what they do often in English soccer, where if there's something they want to commemorate a player for any reason, they actually pick the, the whatever number he's got, they pick the, that as the actual time during one of the halves to actually stand up and applaud. So, I th and there's other things done as well. A lot of the uh, clubs actually wore their indigenous jersey that, that week. There's a number of things done. And I think it did actually show uh, a strong support for, for Adam Goods. He has retired at the end of last year. He played very well in the last couple of, in the finals for the Sydney Swans. And I think he had another year left in him, but I think other things had taken over. So it's left this uneasy situation about the fact that he may have left a year early because of what had actually gone on. I personally was feeling too, if it had continued, that they may have even had to follow the example of European soccer, and that's actually banned supporters from the, from the game, and I mean every supporter. All right, there have been a number of games played in European soccer behind uh, closed doors, no spectators, and potentially, I know it has been described to me by somebody today as being radical, but that was something that as I said, there is a precedent in other sports for it. So I'll leave that open because it never actually had to get that far. Now, going with pregnancy, this is in 2001, Netball Australia wanted to ban pregnant women from uh, participating in, in uh, netball games. And Trudy Gardner then took legal action and she was successful at that, on the grounds that it was discriminatory uh, in, in, under the Sex Discrimination Act. And she was actually awarded uh, just under $7,000, all right? But also potentially, because she was semi-professional in the sense she was playing in the, net, uh, in the netball competitions in Australia, it also raises potential restraint of trade issues there as well. The Australian Sports Commission then produced guidelines and the and not, so it doesn't actually ban the women, all right, but the idea is the fact that they consult, medi uh, get medical advice, etc., then make the decisions themselves. And that's one thing I'd like to make a distinction here between is what they originally had was what I'd call a regulation which had to be enforced and followed. In other words, if you're pregnant, you couldn't play. And what they've now come up with is guidelines, okay, which is suggesting how people should, uh, should act in this particular situation. And that from a legal perspective, there's quite a bit, in my opinion, quite a bit of difference between the two. And what you're fit getting here is a situation where the guidelines are never going to be in breach of the Sex Discrimination Act, but the regulations as they were here clearly were. So that actually was a better way of actually doing it. I think with hindsight, what Netball Australia should have done is actually had more consultation with the players beforehand and maybe come up with these guidelines you know, before actually going through all the legal process that they actually went, went through. I actually teach sport and entertainment law to the uh, sports events management students and I raised this case, uh, I was teaching it a couple of months ago. And one of the students there, she, she said she plays in netball and 
in that, that year she'd actually played against somebody who was quite obviously pregnant and she said they actually felt very uncomfortable playing against her because the fact they were just too scared they were going to knock because she was at a stage where you could clearly see she was pregnant. So that sort of raised the other, and this is why Netball Australia was one of the things they're probably considering at the time was the fact you've got to think of the other competitors as well that they may not feel all that comfortable actually playing against these people. It struck me that this, this particular um, person had just gone too far past where she should have been playing in regards to the pregnancy. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting sort of feedback from, uh, from one of my students. We can learn off our students. All right, just uh, quickly with the, uh, with the an international sport like cricket, it certainly had some issues in the mid to late uh, 2000s. Uh, There's an infamous incident with uh, Andrew Simons and Harbhajan Singh at the SCG. I happened to be there that day, obviously for research purposes, I was at the SCG watching the test cricket. <laughs> Actually, being there, it didn't look much. It was just a little bit of altercation on the field, all right, but then it blew up afterwards. The um, papers were unbelievable the next two or th for the next two or three days. F headlines, front and back pages, and because the, the Indians threatened to walk away from the whole tour. One thing, too, I found interesting about that particular uh, incident as well was that the Indian players felt the Australian players were believed more by the, by, um, I think it was Mike Proctor was the match referee, and they considered that racist in its own right. That's one of the reasons it escalated. And it was a situation there that uh, it was heard, but uh, John Hansen then had a tribunal type hearing, and Harbhajan Singh got off a little bit on a technicality because he, it was, he was, John Han uh, Judge Hansen had been told that he had a clean record when he didn't. Um, but really, his, uh, Judge Hansen's conclusion was he didn't know what had actually happened. You know, there's conflicting stories, and you couldn't clearly say uh, what had actually been said, even. And, uh, what had, you know, and so, therefore, that sort of settled at that particular situation. There's also been problems with uh, some of the spectators as well. Uh, there's a good example was South Africa's Andre Nell was called a Katha lover when he was playing at the S again at the SCG, and that had been two, a couple of years earlier in 2006. That was pro obviously from another South African, a white South African uh, situation there. So, what has developed with International Cricket Council is an anti-racism code for players and player support personnel. So there's two documents: one's for the players and and the player support personnel. And then there's actually one for everybody else effectively, which is the anti-racism policy for international cricket. And that actually includes spectators, all right? I don't know if those who follow cricket, certainly I've noticed at the SCG on the screen, if you, while you, uh, before the match and sometimes during the breaks, they'll have a big sign up there about the fact you shouldn't vilify, ra make racist comments, all those things, and sets out the fact that you can be ejected from the ground and possibly face criminal offences, okay? And even um, at smaller grounds, uh, I often go to some of the games up in Townsville because during the winter, Australia A or Australia Under 19 is often played up there. And even there, they've got the similar sign. You know, it's not on the scoreboard, but it's just a, a green sign, a uh, laminated sign, which they actually have prominently placed as you actually walk in. So they're the sort of things that cricket's done. And I, I think, um, you know, there hasn't had many incidents at all in recent times. So I, I think they're policies that are actually uh, working effectively. I just want to work, move on to um, the Olympic Games. Just quickly touch on the gender issue. Certainly, it was, it was, there was gender discrimination at the formation of the, Olymp uh, new, the modern Olympic Games because they were not there in any form in 1896. Only tennis was in uh, the 1900. Uh, swimming didn't come to 1912, and athletics not to 1928. So, what we have now is certainly an improvement on what was there. And a lot of it did go back to Baron de Corbatan, who didn't want women participating you know, in, in the Olympic Games. So there was clear discrimination in that regard there. What I also find interesting was the fact that the amateur rule came in at that particular time. And again, that was de Corbatan's view that uh, he felt that professional sport was uh, turned um, the athletes into uh, circus performers. That's almost a direct quote. And so they thought they banned any professional athletes, which went completely against actually what the ancient Olympic Games were, because even though the actual Olympic Games themselves were actually uh, amateur in the sense you didn't win anything except that oral roof, the, most of the athletes were professional. There was all these ga games right around Greece in the other rest of the time of the four-year cycle, a bit like the Grand Prix circuit in, in Europe, would be a good analogy, where these people made very good money, and sometimes they were supported by the state. And so he picked up all the ideals of the Olympics, but actually 
conveniently left out that aspect of it and made it purely amateur. And I just feel that was class discrimination, in my opinion. And a good example is actually Australia's Frank Bow Repair. You know, Bow Repair Tyres, he actually founded it. So if you remember nothing else from this talk, you might remember that Bow Frank Bow Repair set up a, a tyre company, but he was actually a, a silver medalist at the 1908 uh, Games in London. But he was banned from the 1912 Olympics because his job was a physical instructor at the time, and that was enough to declare you professional, which, you know, was a little bit unfair as well. So I just sort of throw that in as something that the Olympic Games was definitely uh, had discriminatory issues early in its career. Now there's just two aspects that I now want to look at. First of all is the issue of, again, I'm not saying this is exactly discrimination, but it's the issue of whether disabled people can actually should be able to compete all right, in the able body of the Olympics. Now I'll give you an example, the, by coincidence, uh, two people I referred to are both South African. The first one is the South African swimmer Natalie Dutort, and she competed in the 10K open swim with half, and she lost half of a, uh, one of her legs. But the big thing there was the fact that she had no, uh, nothing else there to add to it. So she was competing, not fully abled, but had nothing to actually replace what she actually had there. So she was just swimming with one and a half legs effectively. All right? So I don't, I don't think any, anybody can have any issue about that. The one that became more problematic was Oscar Pistorius, who's obviously we could do, other, do another talk here if we wanted to in regard to him. Now he'd been born without uh, the fibula bones in, his, in both legs, so he was amputated below the knee when he was about 11. And he always competed in sport, all right, using uh, uh, prosthetics. And then he was starting to run times where it looked like he could qualify for the 2008 Beijing Olympics which started to raise a lot of uh, concerns from the IAAF. They were particularly worried about the, um, the actual the 400 metres uh, relay because of all of the issues with the, uh, you know, it's almost a body contact sport, the 400 metre relay, if you watch it around the, the changeovers. So they brought in a new rule, rule, competition rule 144, which prohibited the use of any technical device that incorporates springs, wheels or any other element that provides the user with an advantage over another athlete not using such a device. And when he went to the, and, and through that, they got uh, sports scientists to do tests, etc., and they reached the conclusion that he did get advantage, all right? And that was because you got, there was more spring from the prosthetics than there was from human ankles, all right? And so therefore, the IWF banned him from competing in able-bodied events, all right? The CAS panel, when they heard it, they, they pointed out this rule was basically brought in for him, all right, in, with him in mind. But that was overturned by the uh, CAS panel because they felt that they, the, the IWF had not asked the sports scientists to determine whether the prosthesis had provided an overall net advantage. They only looked at a few things, all right. So therefore, they felt that it, um, he had not actually breached that rule. The also thing they looked at was the fact that these prosthetics had been used by other athletes, other disabled athletes, and nobody had come anywhere close to the times that he had run. Okay? So therefore they felt that there was no real advantage from these if it's only one person can actually run these sort of times. Just had a note, he did try and argue also that it was discriminatory, but that was actually rejected by CAS. Okay? All right, and they said uh, it, it's, it was a situation where the disability laws only require that an athlete such as posteriors be per permitted to compete on the same footing as others, so there'd be no breach of discrimination. He didn't make the 2008 Olympics, but he did actually make the 2012 Olympics at in London. Uh, I think he reached about the quarterfinals from, some, from memory. He got, I know he got past the first round or two, but didn't get uh, beyond about the middle mid stages. Michael Johnson, the great 400 metre runner from the United States, he came out and he said, look, he greatly admired what he had done, but he also said, he doesn't run like us. There was also apparently some experts who came out and said they felt that they could design tests to actually fully explore what's this, and they would say they would, their results would indicate that it's likely that he does get some sort of advantage and therefore should not be able to compete. Obviously, Oscar himself won't be going to the 2016 Olympics for other reasons. I think there's, and the, uh, by the way, the CAS panel made it very clear that the, their ruling only applied to, um, to Pistorius. 
Also the fact that there may be more evidence may come about to show that he does get an advantage. So it was very much, they limited the decision very much to that one situation. I personally doubt whether, first of all, whether other disabled athletes are likely to get this to the uh, level that he actually did, so for it to become another problem. And I think there's a strong chance the IWF will be able to stop it next time based on the fact that there is an overall advantage of some sort. Okay, but that's, as I said, uh, that's, that's for the future. Now, what has also come up very quite recently is this issue of transgender athletes. Now, we had the situation with Casta Semina. She was ordered to, uh, ordered to undergo sex tests after winning 800 metres at the 2009 World Championships. If you've ever seen her run, she's a very, she does look very masculine. I'm just, that, that's a, just an observation. But she was allowed then to compete at the, at the London Olympics where she won a silver medal. But this, this, what, what did come out was the fact that she has characteristics uh, which indicate that she may be in, the, in between male and female. And I think that's one thing that's starting to come out now is the medical evidence is this clear cut division between male and female is nowhere near as clear cut as people thought it was in the past. All right. Now one of the issues ha that's come up also is the women who have unna naturally high levels of testosterone. All right. In other words, they actually exceed the, the limits that are allowed, but it's all natural. They're not, t they're not actually ingesting anything. Okay. So the IWF has this brought in these, again, you note the word regulations, regulations governing the eligibility of females with hyperandrogenism to compete in women's competition. All right, so that's what they brought in. And there was this, this Indian sprinter, Dante Chand, and she was asked to, to undergo tests, and then she was banned because of the fact that she under, the, under these regulations, she was not allowed to compete a, a, in the women's events because of these naturally high levels of, testoster of testosterone. Then she took that to CAS. First c comment I'd make about the CAS judgment is it's 160 pages. I'm not sure how many of you are uh, familiar with CAS judgments. I've probably read 100 over the years. I read, uh, most of them are in the 30 to 40 page mark. Uh, the Con Albert Contador was 98 pages, which I thought was huge, and this one's 160. So it's four times longer than most CAS judgments, which indicates straight away, doesn't it, this is a very controversial area. Most of it had to do with expert evidence, and they had people on both sides pre presenting evidence. Uh, thing, thing. But I'll actually look more at the, cut through that a bit if you like, and go through more of the legal aspects of it. One of the um, expert evidence was brought in by Chand, a Dr. Kakasis. She pointed out that it was unfair to treat indigen ind indigenous, um, endogenous sorry, testosterone any differently to any other physical variation that may affect athletic performance. So that's one of the things that was presented on the behalf of Chand was, is this any different to being three, um, you know, five centimetres taller than anybody? All right, so I think that's an, an interesting aspect for it. From the legal perspective, the CAS panel held the regulations were discriminatory. All right. And the IWF then had the burden to establish the regulations were reasonable and proportionate to achieve their legitimate objectives. And what they actually came to the conclusion was that while the higher levels of naturally occurring testosterone may increase athletic performance, it was not satisfied, it was more significant than any other variable such as biological factors, and they sort of talked about the height, et cetera, and access to training facilities and coaching. All right? So that was a conclusion that was reached by the CAS panel, which I personally do agree with. All right? What actually happened then was that the, the regulations were declared in, uh, the, invalid. The IAAF was actually given two years. So this was uh, September 19, uh, 19, 2014 to come up with evidence to show that it did actually provide an overall advantage. And I've just li read literally in the last few weeks that what they're going to develop and the proposal, which has to go through meetings, including the, IAA, the IOC, is to produce guidelines for sports. See, so what I'm getting at again, a little bit similar to netball, move away from having a regulation and moving it towards guidelines as to what actually done. I have read some people suggest that maybe the Olympic Games should even think about having three categories, male, female, and transgender, that this 
you know, again, working on this idea that it's not clear cut as, as we've always thought between being male and female. Okay? There was a comment by the CAS panel too, which I thought was relevant as well. It said, the IAAF had acted with conspicuous uh, diligence and good faith throughout the process of developing the regulations. So I think they were very, they were very sympathetic to, to the IAAF. They had this very difficult situation. Is it discriminatory against this particular runner or are you actually being discriminatory, if you like, against the other female athletes because somebody's been giving them, has been given a, a natural, you know, a, been given an advantage because of the fact they have naturally occurring testosterone at le much higher levels than they actually do. So I think this is a very open situation at the moment because uh, at the moment these regulations cannot be enforced, okay? And it looks like it's going to become as guidelines. So to summarise, Ending up what I've been saying here, I think that's the thing that's got to keep, keep in mind. If you have these regulations which are forced on people, you have situations that it may well be illegal, all right, either in legislation like the um, Sex Discrimination Act in Australia, or you're in a situation where CAS will held it's discriminatory, and if you can't actually show why it's needed, then they'll actually say they're going to be invalid. Okay, so sometimes look, you, wording it as, writing it as guidelines is going to be a better option than actually having more stricter uh, regulations uh, from, that, from a legal perspective. Okay, that's it.